The Bible said that we're to love God. We sang about that tonight. We sang about it in the, in the heart sense, in the emotional sense. But you know, there's another way that God tells us to love Him. And what is that? With our heart and our, with our mind. Do you know that we're to love God with our minds? And the way that we love God with our minds is to know Him in His Word. And the Word of God reveals who the Lord is. And so tonight, what I would like to do is help us as a congregation to love Him more with our, with our heart, yes, but also with our minds. I thought about this today. That much, You know that realized, uh, I realize, and I, maybe you do as well, that much of the heresy that's in American Christianity comes out of the charismatic movement. And that troubles me greatly because I am a Pentecostal charismatic person. The Holy Spirit's filled me many years ago, and I, I love the Holy Spirit with all my heart, the third person of the Trinity. But I thought about this also, that if I, can, if I give you a fish, you'll eat for a day. But if I teach you how to fish, you can eat for a lifetime. And what I pray is that, that we as a congregation would grow in such a way is that we're not gullible. And there's many, let's just say it this way, let's just be honest, many and maybe most charismatic congregations are very gullible. And I want our congregation to be wise and not be twisted about with every, blown about with every wind of doctrine, but we can grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray one more time. Father, I ask your blessing on this tonight. I pray, God, that you would teach us how to tool out your word, how to love your, you with our minds. I pray that you would bless us. I pray that you'd give us a thirst and a hunger to know you like we've never known you before. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Look at the scripture on the screen. Tonight we're talking about digging deeper into God's word. We weren't able, uh, they figured it out the last second of how to get this on the screen. So and it just didn't have time, so I've given it to them. So I'm not able to do one part of really what I want to do this evening. But look at these verses. This is uh, 1 John 2, 14. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has, uh, you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men. Now notice this. Because you are strong, notice the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I'll just say this. There's no strong Christian without being strong in the Word of God. And I will add to that, there are no strong congregations without being strong in the Word of God. Psalm chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, But his delight, this is the godly man, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Hear that. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he does meditate day and night. Notice this. Notice what the fruit and the result of delighting in the law of God is. It's this, and meditate on it day and night. He will be what? Like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water. Then there's going to be fruit. There's going to be a result of godliness and productivity, which it says, which yields its fruit in, in its season, and its leaf does not wither. There's going to be a vitality, a constant spiritual vitality, and whatever he does, he prospers. He's prospering in the will of God. He's He's, there's life there, there's strength there, there's, there's a rootedness there. Why? Because the Word of God is in us. So let's jump into this tonight. So what are the first steps into digging into God's Word? I've just given you some blanks. This will be on the screen. This first part will be very quick, and that's simply what you know, and that's you have to value it. You have to see value in the Word of God. Psalm 192, 72, 119, 72 says this. David said in uh, one chance, they said, I love your Word more than thousands of gold and silver coins. Do we value the word of God like that? Value it? You know, where your treasure is, there your heart is. If our heart sees the word of God as a treasure, it's going to be something that we want to tool out, that we want to mine out, that we want to discover. We've got to value it. Secondly, if you're going to love the word of God and know the word of God, and this is part, of, part of this is a word that we don't like to hear sometimes, but there's got to be a personal commitment. Because the, to know the Word of God, it's going to take time and it's going to take commitment. 2, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent. Old King James says study, but it's, it's really be diligent to sow yourself approved to God. Be diligent in this personal commitment. And then, something we'll reference tonight, you've got to choose a good translation of the Bible. I'm going to suggest 
some this evening. I've given you uh, a list of things here for you to take. And, you know, I, I, one of the things I realized this evening, this is, of course, a little different. This is more technical this evening, which is probably good for us. Amen? But I've given you a sheet with just some je- suggestions. There is, a, there is a mountain of great material that's available in the English language of spiritual things. Uh, you are the most blessed people probably to ever live as far as spiritual material goes. It's absolutely amazing. There's some great, there's some great tools of one-volume commentaries. I've suggested those here. There's some that are a little more harder and, and sets. There's some good study Bibles. There's so many study Bibles. I mean, there's the Fishing Study Bible and the Mud Slinging Study Study Bible and the Door. I mean, I'm being funny. There's more study Bibles. We probably have too many. I'm going to share some personal opinion tonight. There's probably way too many English translations, you know, but anyway. Uh, some good study Bibles here, some wonderful translations here. Uh, there, some of them are different. I'm going to show that. And then some reference materials. I told someone one time, if, uh, if I was on a desert island and I had my Bible and I could choose one other book, it would probably be that book right there, the Haley's Bible Handbook. You know, it's not... Um, it doesn't cover every subject thoroughly, but that thing is so chock full of great material. So if I had one a Bible and one volume that I was allowed to take, it would probably be that little volume right there. It is an amazing little volume. So I won't stop there too long. But you need to choose a good translation of the Bible. I'm going to put a little uh, comparison chart up here in just a moment. But... Um, we need a good, I'm going to suggest several Bibles. And then we need to have a plan. We need to establish a schedule. Last week I preached four sermons. I preached a funeral. I preached Wednesday night, full sermons. I preached and taught a full teaching Sunday morning before most of you got here. We do have men's Bible study Sunday morning. And then uh, minister Sunday morning. All did four, four different full sermons. If, if I didn't have a schedule, if I didn't manage my time, there is no way. In fact, I would be in deep trouble. Most mornings, I'm up at 3 to 4 o'clock, go right to my study, and start. Just what I've done. That's not for everyone. Doesn't mean you have to do it. Doesn't mean I'm more spiritual than anyone. It means that my body clock works different than yours, mainly. But then you need to be willing to invest time in study, and I've kind of referenced that. So let's quickly look at this. How do you choose a good translation of the Bible? Uh, are there bad translations? Are there you know, good translations, bad translations? Are there things that you should run from your life from? Um, l- l- show this spectrum chart, if you would, translation. Um, this is just a spectrum here of translations. Uh, you've got you know, your interlinear. You say, well, what's that? An interlinear is when you have the Greek translation... And then you have the English right under it. And they usually have morphology and lemma and everything. But you, you also have reverse interlinear, where you have the English and then, and then the manuscript. This is, this is a set of commentaries I bought when I was like, I think I was like 20 years old. And these are probably my favorite commentaries. This is just a portion of the Greek grammar. And it, this is Pentecostal. It's very theological. It's absolutely amazing. And I, I haven't pulled, pulled it out in a while, but I just looked at some of the notes that I put in here and just working through some of the grammar. And then uh, it's just wonderful. But in here, there's, it actually has an interlinear that's actually for practice, actually, on this. But I got these. And I actually, as a, as a young minister, I had to pay these out. I think they were like $300. They're not in print anymore. To get them now, $2,000 at least. And I have them here and I have them digitally also. Say amen to that. <laughs> like an antique, but they're not, I don't think they're in print anymore. You can get them, I think, just like the Old Testament for $2,000. You know? So anyway, but as far as Bible translations, you have, a, you have a spectrum here. You have an interlinear New American Standard. That's what I read from this evening. You have things like ESV, which came out in 2001, RSV, which is done by the National Council of Churches, more of a liberal group. You got the the King James, which was, you know how long that's been around, was 1611. But you know what? 
People say, well, I'm King James only. You're not reading the 1611. You're reading the 1769. There's been probably 80,000 changes in it. So anyway, New King James, 1982. This is HCS. Uh, I can't read it. But, but it's Holman. It's the Baptist deal. Uh, new Revised Standard. This here. It's very neuter, uh, uh, gender neutral. Wouldn't, wouldn't suggest it. Uh, NAB, that's Catholic. God bless the Catholics. Amen. I think that's the Jerusalem Bible. NIV, dynamic, I'll show you in just a minute why they why why when I look at a King James or a New King James, look at a like a, an NIV, why do they sound different? Why and then there's there's really a, there's no, you know, there's conspiracy theorists everywhere. I don't believe there's some nefarious kind of, you know, scheme to change the word of God, but there are different philosophies of translation. You got word for word, you got paraphrase, you got thought for thought. NIV is more of a thought for thought. TNIV crashed and burned because it was more neutrogen and nobody bought it. And it crashed and burned, uh, NCE. So these are, you know, you got the message, the Living Bible by Mr. Taylor. Uh, you know, the reader's version wouldn't suggest these. NLT is pretty good for a paraphrase. So there's just different, uh, different philosophies of translations. Um, and and let, let me show you this also. Put the history... Translation history. I can't stay too long on this. Right here, this is out of the Thompson Chain Bible. I have a nice Thompson Chain here. I would suggest a Thompson Chain is a very wonderful topical Bible. You know, it doesn't have a lot of notes, just topical change. You can really get into it. Um, but you know, you think about okay, there there have been there have been so many translations of the Bible, and you think there's like the King James and like the NIV, and that's it. No, look at this. There's, you know, you got the original manuscripts that came from the, the Holy Spirit and the apostles, ancient manuscripts, Masoretic, Vulgate, and then Wycliffe, Tyndale. He burned, burned that, burned, he, he died for the faith. You, you ought to thank Mr. Tyndale. You ought to read about Mr. Tyndale. These are people that gave their life. He, he died for translating the Bible into a language that, to the common man's language. Died for you and me. Died for the Lord Jesus. Mr. Tyndale, God bless him. You know, then Coverdale, Matthews, the Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible. Do it. Oh, see, lots of Bibles before the King James. Come on, say amen. King James, and let me say this about the King James, an absolute masterpiece. We'll never probably have anything like it for 400 years. Probably more people have been won to Christ through the King James Version. It's just archaic language. It's not the way we speak today, but an absolute masterpiece it just I, I can't say enough about that. Just it's a, a beautiful translation. And by the way, if you read the King James, you're reading the Word of God. If you love it, wonderful. That's great. That's wonderful. Uh, English Revised, the 1901 American Standard, and then you have the more modern translations. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was a great discovery. And so uh, I will say, um, I'll probably say a little more in a second. But the thing is. And this is probably simplistic. Now, I realize this, that we have a broad range of understanding here. I can't be technical. I've got to cover everyone. So you guys, you guys know that. Uh, there's, there's two kind of, and this is simplistic, but there's really two families of manuscripts. The King James and New King James come for what is the Byzantine manuscripts, in which, uh, you know, there's, there's more of those, there, there's more manuscripts but they're much younger. In other words, those who translated the King James Bible had very young manuscripts. And so since that time, we, there's been incredible strides and discoveries of manuscripts that are way, way farther, closer to the apostles. They're old manuscripts. And most of the modern translations, the one I read out tonight, comes from what is called the Alexandrian. It's, it's a shorter. It's, called the, it's more critical. And so, anyway, not that... Not that most of you care about that, but that's just stuff. So uh, watch this little video. This is a very good understanding of Bible translation. Watch this three-minute video, then we'll move along. Here. This is very good, by the way. Yeah, one of, the, one of the most common questions I get asked, honestly, is what is the best English Bible translation? And no joke, when my wife was delivering our first baby in the hospital, she was in labor the female doctor was talking to me and she said, now what is the best English Bible translation? We had this discussion while my wife was in labor. But um, 
I like to tell people we have an embarrassing riches of translations in English. Mm -hmm. We have so many good translations, so we need to be aware that there are many languages in the world that do not even have one translation. And so the debates that we sometimes have among ourselves are kind of silly in light of that. Now, are there any bad translations? I would say yes. A translation that is that a cult group has changed the word of God, that's a bad translation. Like the New World Translation by Jehovah's Witnesses is a bad translation because it's driven by a heretical doctrinal view. But among translations completed by committees of, of scholars, we really have many different choices. And, and the best way to explain it is there's a spectrum. And along that spectrum, you have some translations that are more word for word, and those are called formally equivalent. And then you have translations that are more meaning for meaning, and that's more functionally equivalent. So on the far end here, more formally equivalent, we would have a New American Standard Bible. A little further back this way, the ESV. Maybe in the middle here, we would have the NIV, and then we go over here all the way to functionally equivalent, more meaning for meaning, the New Living Translation. Now, I all those translations I mentioned, I think, are good translations, but they have a different um, translation philosophy. And so for the New American Standard, for example, if there are 10 words in the Greek, they'll try to have 10 words in the English, and they'll try to follow the same structure of the Greek sentence. Now, sometimes that, that results in the translation being a little bit harder to read, whereas the New Living Translation, you may have 10 words in Greek, may end up having 15 words in English. And what was a prepositional phrase at the end of the Greek, phrase, Greek verse may be at the beginning of the English because it sounds more natural there. So I, I encourage people to have multiple translations and sometimes to compare them. If, and if, when they differ, explore that further with a study Bible or through reading commentaries. The, the best way to, another way to understand formal and functional equivalence would be with, with modern languages. So when I, I've gone to China, I was a teacher in China, one of the greetings in China is ni chilema, have you eaten, right? Now, if we translate that very literally, have you eaten, it, it, the, you know, say I'm with a group of Americans and, and I, I say, the, this, this pastor has asked, have you eaten? And I think they would think, well, does he want to invite us to dinner or is this something wrong? What, uh, you know, what's going on? Whereas he's basically just saying, hey, we're glad, glad to have you here. What's up? Or is everything okay? And so the, I, I could do a New American, Stand trans, New American Standard translation, have you eaten? I could do a New Living translation. The pastor says, greetings, he's glad you're here. Right now, both of those are accurate in, the, in what I'm intending to do. And so that's one way to think about Bible translation. Thanks for watching. You can submit your... All right, thank you. Did you see that? see that? That was good, wasn't it? That was excellent. Okay, let's, let me talk a little bit just about choosing a translation for devotional reading, for devotional use. Usually most people... Now, this is not something I like to do. So there's, there's, usually there's two, two types of Bibles people use for devotional use. I personally use the same Bible I preach from. It's the same Bible I do devotion from. I don't like preach out of one translation and then read out of another one. It just, I just, that's just my preference. You might do that. But one is called a paraphrase. He mentioned that. I, I don't personally care for a paraphrase Bible. Let me list them. New Living Translation, Living Bible, The Message, uh, Phillips Translation is maybe one. And basically what they do is they attempt to get at the meaning and, and kind of put it in a modern context. They're not so worried about word for word. Just let's get, let's get the meaning. Now, are you listening? Say amen. Are there some translations we should avoid? Absolutely. I'm going to mention a new one that you should run from with your life. It's called the Passion Translation. It's probably worse than the Jehovah Witness Bible. It is horrid. Terrible. I'll just mention that. If you want to know more about that, I'll talk later. The Passion Translation, horrible eisegesis. Horrible. Also, I would say, be cautious about the Living Bible and the message by Mr. Peterson. Here's, here's the reason why. The Living Bible, the message, are one individual translations. Just one person doing them. Where we need to be more involved in, in, in translations that are more committee translations, like the NIV, the King James, the New American Standard, 
uh, New King James that I've preached out of for 20 years. So there's paraphrase. I would be cautious with the paraphrase, but some people like to do the devotions that way. And then there's thought for thought translation, which is like the New International, the New Living Translation. And they're not so much word, word for word. It's more thought for thought. So the paraphrase is just kind of a paraphrase and a thought for thought. So let's, uh, let's look at this. So how do I choose a translation, not so much for devotion, but for deeper study? I would say definitely the word for word translations. King James, New King James, uh, New American Standard, excellent. Uh, because what you do, what you do when, you, when you're studying for a deeper study, you're really getting down in to what the words mean. And, and when I prepare sermons, it's the words that I get points from. It's the words that, that uh, it's just wonderful. So uh, actual, you know, we need actual word equivalents. I'll mention them again. King James, New, King, New American Standard, English Standard, uh, you know, ESV, that's a good translation. Uh, here's what you need to know. These are translations. We don't have the originals anymore. Amen? There's no original manuscripts anymore. They're all worn out and gone. But we have great, wonderful English translations. I'll, I'll just say this, and I, didn't, I don't want to get too technical, but really the differences in all the translations you could put on a single space, half a notebook paper. The differences in translation. None of that deals with doctrine, as far, or with doctrine, none of it deals with, with like doctrines of salvation. Usually it's, word, it's numbers and, and things like that. But we have wonderful English translations. And how do, how do we know that? You know, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was amazing. It just verified that we do have the very word of God. And so I'll just mention again some translations need to be avoided, some with a little caution. Avoid the Passion Mr. by Mr. Simmons or S Simmons. Avoid the New World Translations, Jehovah Witness Bible. No, probably most of you not do that. Uh, use caution with the Living Bible, the Message. You know, well, because a lot of these translators have an agenda. They're not trying to get down to the meaning of the words. They really have an agenda. And and we have a plethora of English Bibles. And to get a copyright, you've got to have a certain amount of change. So you've got to change something to get a copyright. So somewhere out there, something's being changed. I mean, you get far enough out there, you get over 100 translations, it's not all going to be right. So just be careful about that. Some of the modern translations are neutral, uh, uh, gender neutral, which concerns me very, very great. So just be aware of some of those. So anyway, just mention that. One of the things that I do when I, if a new translation comes out, I go to major important passages like John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Just key passages that I, that I go to and watch how they translated those. In the Jehovah Witness Bible, John 1 and 1 is, in this Bible, in your Bible, it's in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In the, Jews, in the Jehovah Witness Bible, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was a God. The Word was a God. No, he wasn't just, he was God. And so I go to key passages. So let's move along quickly. I don't want to get bogged down. So what are the common Bible reading plans? How do I approach the Word of God? And, and you know this. One, one way is just to read the Bible straight through. You know, and basically three chapters a day. Think about that. Do you know that anyone can read the Bible through in a year? Three chapters a day will take you through the entire Bible. Three chapters a day. And I would suggest this. Some people... Just, I just want to read through. And so uh, they just start and they put, you know, they put a, a marker and then the next day they go back and then they go through the next day and they just go through the Bible that way. The only problem with that is you stay in the Old Testament most of the year, you know, and we're New Testament Christians. So I would suggest another way, and that's simply this, read a little of the Old Testament, read a little of the New Testament every day. You know, if you read five chapters a day like that, you go through the Old Testament once, you go through the New Testament twice, five chapters a day. But some people like to read Old Testament, little, little New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. How many Proverbs are there? Come on. How many chapters? 31. How many days in most month? 31. Proverb a day, chapter a day. That's another way to do it. And then uh, I would say uh, another way to read the Bible is chronologically. Now you understand the Bible is not chronological. The Bible is categorical. 
In other words, you got Moses in the, in the Pentateuch, you've got the Old Testament prophets, the minor, the major, you've got Job and Psalm and Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, the poetry part, you've got New Testament. You know, even Matthew is set up topically. And so, but chronologically, there's actually Bibles that you can buy, which are called chronological Bibles that'll take you through. And with the little app they have with all the, all the Bible reading, there are so many Bible It gives me a headache. You look at all those Bible reading plans, you go, dear Jesus, help us. But you could read chronologically, or you could read topically. I wouldn't suggest that, so I won't stay long on that. You know, Bibles like the, the Life Application Bible, uh, Maxwell Leadership Bible, there's Prophecy Study Bibles. I don't really like those kind of study Bibles. You may have one. You may like it. More power to you. It's not what, it's not, I just like to study the Bible. I don't like there to be a spin on it. And a lot of times I don't like to have a Bible with notes, like a, this, this Thompson chain that I have right here. It's one I bought many years ago, and I had to put it in here because it got all loose, but just uh, wonderful. Just text, and it has some topical chains, and you're just, you're just digging in. You know, to the very to the very word of God there. So, this, those are just my opinion too. You may like those things, but that's just not something. So, how do we? What's the best way to uh, primary way to interact with the Bible? Well, I would say first of all, just devotionally, in devotional reading, what, what you do in devotional reading, this is just for spiritual enrichment. I mean, you know, there's times that we should just spend time with God. Amen. We shouldn't be looking for a sermon, and we preachers can do that. And that's a tendency and a temptation that we preachers that are in here, we have a temptation. And if you teach the Bible, if you teach a class, or if you have a responsibility to teach, you'll start going into just reading. All of a sudden, you're, you're looking for a sermon. Oh, that's a great sermon. So we've got to avoid that. But here's the thing. We need to read it devotionally. And that's just simply personal time of interaction with God in His Word. You, you have a, maybe a little notebook. You have some highlighters. I have a certain way that I highlight have a certain way that I do things. Blue has to do with heavenly themes. Green has to do with like faithfulness and godliness. Yellow has to do with promises. Purple has to do with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, royal themes. And then I, I use red for like redemptive themes. There's so many ways to mark, but you need to mark your Bible. You need to underline. You need to write little notes. There's great systems that you can do to, to do that. Here's what A.W. Tozer said about this. He said this, he said, the sacred page, the Bible, is not meant to be an end, but only a means to an end. Notice this, which is knowing God himself. So in other words, just knowing the Bible and knowing the facts is not the end. The end is, I want to know God. I want to walk with God. I want to fellowship with God. I want to walk more closely with him. And I thought that was great. So we can read it devotionally. But we also need to approach it another way, and that is study books of the Bible. That's how it was given in, in, in books of the Bible, in, more in depth. So in other words, you need to be working through a book of the Bible. You need to pick a Bible, like an, an easy book, like Philippians. Joy, joy, joy is mentioned over and over again. You need to be working through the Bible. I know the Bible seems overwhelming, but you, know, you, have, a all, you have a lifetime. We have some older believers here that they have loved the Word of God for decades and decades and decades. And through a lifetime, you can work through the entire Bible. You can work through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. You can know the themes. You can know the writers. You can know the background, the history. You can know the time frame. Why? Because we need to work through these books. You need a good, good Bible, good Bible study, um, Bible, uh, study Bible, and a good commentary. So you, you need to approach the Bible devotionally where you're just reading it, meditating on it, like I said in Psalms. You need to do book studies, and the way you do that is not like the little, the little bread box. You ever, years ago, they had like a little bread box, and you need, have one little scripture, and you take it out, and you'd like read that one verse. I could never do that. I could never do that. I would say, where did it come from? What chapter is it in? <laughs> what's, what's around it? What's the context? Who wrote it? It would drive me crazy. What I'd do with all that, I would just dump that in the trash can and I'd go find my Bible. So we need to study paragraphs. We need to look at the words. You need to look at the setting, etc. So that's, that's very important. Background, date, author, etc. And then you can approach it devotionally, uh, books of the Bible, but also topically. As I said, I have my Thompson chain here. 
And this is a wonderful way. You know, as you open the Word of God, what you need to do, first of all, you need to pray. And the reason you need to pray because the Holy Spirit's our teacher. You have commentaries, study Bibles. Okay, that's good. There's some, there's some good ones. There's some bad ones. But the thing is, that's what men have said about the Word of God. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. As you open the Bible, the Holy Spirit can be your teacher. And that's where you need to pray, like Psalm 119.18. Open thou my eyes, that I may see wonderful things out of your law. Or John 16.13, where it says that the Holy Spirit will guide you and I into all truth. So, so think about it. So what do I need to do? If I want to know about prayer, there's Bibles like this. I can, I can go through the scriptures and I can find everything the Bible says about prayer. Uh, Genesis 4.26, then men begin to call on the name of the Lord. All through the Bible, Psalm, or Jeremiah 33, other verses. Jesus prayed. What about the Lord's prayer? What about his prayer in John 17? What does Paul say about prayer? Many wonderful prayers that Paul prayed, like in Colossians 1, 9 through 11. Wonderful prayers. You can study the Bible that way. Prayer, you can study God, study the Father, study Jesus, study the church, study the family. What does the Bible say about these topics? That's a wonderful way to study the Scripture. And what are the tools? Topical Bible, concordance, Word study, books that you have, dictionaries, cross-references. Uh, some of those are on that page. But you definitely need to pray definitely before, before you begin. Okay? Now, fourth, and that's this. What are some of the challenges to getting in Scripture? What are some of the challenges to getting in to the Word of God? There's actually some gaps. There's some gaps that have to be bridged if we're going to get in the Word of God. In fact, there are four gaps. And here's the reason. I live in 2019. The Bible was written 2,000 years ago and beyond, of course. You know, the Psalms written, what, 3,500 years ago? That's a pretty big gap, right? How am I going to bridge the gap? There's four gaps that must be bridged, and that's this. Language, culture, history, and geography. We'll go through these. I see you writing. We'll go through these. But there's four gaps that have to be bridged if we're really going to understand the Word of God. Language, culture, history, and geography. Let's deal with language first. Now, we know that Paul did not speak English, right? We know that Paul did not speak King James English. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm going to read that King James Bible like Paul did. Hallelujah. But actually, we don't speak or we don't, our language, our native language, is not the language of the Scripture, the original Scriptures. The language of the Scripture, of course, you know probably, is what, Hebrew, it's Greek, and ancient Chaldean or Aramaic. And those are just not languages that we speak today. And, and listen, even those who speak those languages today or understand those to some extent, there's, a, there's another problem. Modern Greek is not like ancient Greek. In fact, the truth is, they don't even know how it was truly pronounced completely. If you, get, if you get an audio or a CD of someone speaking Greek, Koine Greek, what you'll find out, they'll use, some think it was pronounced this way, Erasmus, Erasmus pronunciation, others, other, they don't really know. So there's, there's a language gap, amen? There's a language gap between all of this. And, and another thing is that language changes over time. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Charger, everyone say Charger. Now, to us, what does the charger mean? What do you think, uh, auto mechanic? When I say charger, what do you think? Battery charger, but a, but a Dodge charger. We think of a car, a charger. Do you know that well, if I said, man, that's a cool charger, you'd think, man, that's a cool car. But many years ago, a charger was a horse. But in Bible times, the Bible said they brought, in the King James, they brought the head of John the Baptist on a on a charger, platter. Language can change. You see how translations are different? Language just changes a little bit. It's a real, a real challenge to this. But our challenge is this, and this is what I long for. I, I not only, you know, people say, well, the, what does the Bible mean to me? You know, like you go to these little home Bible studies, and they'll say, well, what does that verse mean to you? That's really not even the first question. That may not even be the tenth question. The first question is this, what did it mean to the original writers? That's the main, here, 
you study the Word of God, remember this. Context is king. It's king. What did it mean in its original setting? Now, yes, we need to apply it to today because we're the followers of Jesus too. But you have to go back. And so there's a huge... you see the gap? Do you see the language gap? You know, you read a, uh, King James and it says charger, you know, but it's a platter. It's a plate. And, and so there's just challenges. But we need to get back to what it really meant to the, to the original writers, the original authors, you know, and there's idiomatic phrases. There's, there's, you know, there's figures of speech. For instance, in Songs of Solomon, the Shilamite, he said, has dove's eyes. That's Songs of Solomon 115, has dove's eyes. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean, dove's eyes? So we got to look at origin, formation, history of words. In other words, the etymology. That means h- how are words used? What's the, what's the etymology of the word? For instance, the word obedience. The word obedience in your English translation has an etymology about it. You know, it comes from hupako, uh, akuo, and then hupo, which means this. Which mean, It means obedience, but it means to hear, and hupo means to be under. So it really means this. It means that we are to hear and respond as those hupo under authority. So you may try to think, you know what they mean, but what did they originally mean? There's an etymology about those words. There's construction. There's the verbs of the, of the Greek have, have certain moods and certain meanings. And I won't go into to all that, but the, it is very, very important. It's just a different language. There's, so in other words, there's a big gap. And we've got to bridge that gap at some level. At some level. I'm not saying you've got to be a great scholar, but you have to be able to bridge that gap. There's literary style. There's poetic. There's historical. There's prophetic. There's ap- apocalyptic. And it's different, it's different than the present day. So in other words, the songs of Solomon need to be interpreted different than the book of Judges. Amen? Completely different, different, different type of literature. One is literal and historical. The other is symbolic. The other is figurative. And so that's important. So there's, there's what? There is the language barrier. It's a pretty big barrier in some cases. And then there's, secondly, B, there's a cultural gap. There's a cultural gap. See, our world is very different than the world of the Bible. It's very different. The world of the Bible was Eastern and agrarian farming. There was, you know, the culture of the Bible was farming, shepherding. There was, you know, a, a system of bartering. You know, the, even, even, those, even those in the scripture lived in different cultures. Daniel lived in a way different culture than Amos did. So that we've got to look at what culture the scripture came from. What was the culture of the day? I mean, things you read through the Bible, head coverings. How many, I don't see any head coverings in here. We're not making the women wear head coverings. What about meat offerings to idols? What about women being silent in the church? Oh, we ought to preach on that. Come on. What does that mean? Well, unless you understand the culture of the day, and and let me say it this way, when you understand the culture of the day, then you start understanding what it means. And then when you get there, you're able to more to see if it applies to you today, or how you can apply it. And then think about the materials, the cultural gap of materials they used, you know, the transportation they used, the cooking, the clothing, the farming, the weapons, you know, the housing, the animal life, taxation, balance and scales, weights and measures, raising, raising sheep. Those are things that many of those things we just don't do today. Mark, Mark 12, 42, how big or little was the woman's offering in Mark 12, 42? How valuable was the sparrow in Luke 12? How expensive was the bonfire when they confessed their deeds in Acts 19? How much manna was placed in the ark, Exodus 6.33? Balance, weights, measurements, ways that they did things. So, And we've got to understand the social order of, of the day. What about marriage customs in that day, different than our day? Some of those marriages went on for seven days. Uh, biblical trades, economics, legal requirements, civil law, social customs. What about betrothal? That has to do with Mary and Joseph. Smelting. What's the avenger of blood? What in the world's that? Cities of refuge. I preached a sermon years ago on the city of refuge. Different culture. So we have to somehow bridge the gap of language. You've got to bridge the gap of culture. And to do that, you've got to get some tools. And I've tried to suggest those. Then, you know, you've got to distinguish between cultures. I mean, 
What about the Babylonian culture, the Assyrian culture, Persia, Medo-Persia, Medo the Greek culture, the Roman culture, the Jewish culture, of course. The Bible was written in many of those cultures. What were they like? What was the Roman law regarding scourging and crucifixion? That affects Jesus Christ our Lord. What about how the Romans, when they won a victory, they would parade those they've conquered? Paul references that in 2 Corinthians 2.14. He, represents the, he, he references that, how the Romans would do that. And he represent, represented it to Christ in the church. So there's the language gap. Then there's the cultural gap. Then thirdly, see, there was the third gap. That's the historical gap. And I won't touch long on this, but just simply, it's just different than our world. Way, way different, actually. It existed a long time ago. Most of the superpowers in that day are gone. There's no more Ninevites, Edomites, Hittites. They're all gone. But yet, those are some of the superpowers of the day. That's where the scriptures uh, were written. What about the, the political world of the day? What about the economic? What about the religious? What's, what's a Baal? What's an Asherah? What's a Molech? These are things that are in your Bible. So you've got to look at the historical setting. And then, lastly, the geographical setting. Uh, large cities, Rome was the power of the day, the greatest city of the, that day. What about rural places like Sinai Peninsula? What about cities, sometimes small cities called Babel that became great cities called Babylon? How did all that happen? What about topography? When we were in Israel, it's amazing, the topography. When you think the, the man went, where did he go? Did he go up to Jericho or did he go down to Jericho? Remember the man, Luke 10? He went, a man went down to Jericho. Topography. Jerusalem is about 3,000 feet above sea level. He went down to Jericho. Jericho's 840 plus feet below sea level. The man went down to Jericho. When we went down, I mean, it's, it's like a dangerous place in that day, certainly. 17 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. Difficult journey. Man went down. That's topography. And then there's other things we need to understand. Fig trees. Book 11, olive trees, cedar trees, cedars of Lebanon, palm trees, Psalm 92. All of these, these and many times symbolic language, it references us. Animals, Jesus called Herod what? An old what? Fox, you old fox. Well, he said the disciples were to be harmless as doves. Animals, climate, weather, mountains, seas. All through the scripture. It's important. This is, this is maybe a little laborious, but it's loving God with our mind. Okay? Now look at this. Here's the cool thing. And I'm winding this down. Here's the neat thing, and that's this. There's those that have gone before us that have actually paved the way for us. There's those that have done incredibly hard work to get us tools that we can, that we can mine out the Word of God. And, and I would just suggest a few. One is a good Bible concordance. A concordance is, you can find ever a complete concordance like this, and this is in a certain translation. Uh, every word, every major word in the Bible, you can, you can go, you can find it. Love, faith, holiness, Saint Hybrid, you can find it quickly. You can get to these things quickly. Man, somebody took a lot of time to do this. There's this concordance, there's a Strong's concordance, which is an amazing, an amazing tool, uh, different kinds of concordance. There's Young's, Crude's, and Strong's. I heard someone say one time, the Young is for the Young's, the Crude's for the Crude, and the Strong's for the Strong. But wonderful tools. Lexicon, that just is a fancy word for dictionary. And you can get to the meaning of words. You can find out, what does sanctification mean? What does holiness mean? What, is, what does the name Jesus mean? You know, etc. Wonderful tools out there. Dictionaries, encyclopedias, wonderful background information. There's some good stuff. Like I said, this little handbook here. Handbooks are another thing. Uh, this little thing here. It doesn't. It's not exhaustive. And I guess the weakness of it is it deals. It doesn't deal really real, real in depth. But but there's a wonderful information in many of these little handbooks. Then you know, atlases and maps. You know, the back of your Bible has some wonderful little maps and atlases. And you can find out where was the wilderness wandering. You can find it. Where were Paul journeying? How did he went? Came from Tarsus. Where is that? Etc. 
And then great commentaries, wonderful commentaries. Um, the, the thing is that there's some great tools online, by the way, also. Amen? I mean, there's amazing how much stuff. When we started out, there was none of that stuff online. Man, there's so much stuff online. You know, I know that a lot of that stuff would be very expensive, but some is not. Half price books, you can get most of this stuff, a lot of this individual stuff at half price books were pennies, pennies on the dollar from what it cost originally if you really want to get in to the Word of God. And then lastly, just manners and customs, and I've talked a little about that. And just uh, loving God, loving God with his word. I would say one more thing here before we conclude, and that's this, that um, here's a little Bible, or here's a little book, rather, that I've actually, this is my second one. Somebody stole my other one. I loaned it, and they didn't give it back. You know, that's why you write your name. I actually have a stamp that I, that I stamp my books with. But anyway, this is called The King James Only Controversy by Dr. James White. It's a very excellent little book. And it really just talks a little about what, I talk, what the gentleman talked about, differences in translation. And it's a very, very wonderful little explanation of, of uh, you know, there's kind of there's some King James only folks out there. And listen, I love the King James Bible, but it's not the only translation, probably not the best translation. But anyway, that's there. So I want you to stand with me if you would. And I know this has been a little technical, and I probably meant it to be that way. Uh, but I think we need to love God with our minds. And there's, I want to say, I want to end where I began, and that's this: there's no strong Christian without being strong in the Scriptures, and there's no strong church without being strong in the Word of God and committed to the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. I want you. I don't want to just give you a fish. I want to teach you how to fish, how to get in the Word of God whether devotionally or study topically or book to book or, or good materials that I can suggest to you that will help you to become a better and a stronger Christian. And I want that for our congregation. That's, that's very important. Amen? Amen? I want to pray. Father, I just ask that tonight that maybe some, some simple thing that I said this evening, Lord, would spur someone to say, I want to love the Word of God more. And those that love it, Lord, would love it more. And that we would meditate in it. And, and Lord, that we would, as we read it, we would allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, I pray you would bless your people this evening with, with wonderful grace and mercy. Lord, I, I, I pray that we would grow. Lord, I pray our families would once again return to times of Bible reading together. We know that in, in past times, families read the Bible together. Lord, let us read. Let us meditate on scripture. Lord, we thank you. I pray that, Lord, that your blessing will be upon us as we take our journey in the word of God. I pray, God, that you would give grace and mercy. And Lord, as has already been prayed, I pray again, Lord, that you'd meet every need that we have tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you're dismissed this evening.